Welcome everyone to a um, special event through the Mark Allen Everett reading series. Um, we are very happy to uh, welcome our distinguished guest, Afa Michael Weaver. Thank you. <laughs> um, before we begin, um, I'd like to uh, thank a few people, the Mark Allen Everett reading series. Um, our special guest, Mrs. Nancy Yock, is here. Ms. Nancy Yock is here. There she is. I'd like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences and Chinese Literature Today. And thank you all um, for coming. This is a nice group. Um, uh, before we get started with the public con conversation, let me say that there will be a reception immediately following this. We will partake of food and wine if you are 21 and older. Please show your ID. Nobody here wants to be arrested. And, um, and then after the reception, we will have the poetry reading by Professor Weaver. So I hope um, you all can stay through the entire event. It's going to be fabulous, as every event through the Everett Reading Series is. Um, I'm not going to do a um, formal introduction of Mr. Weaver because um, uh, Professor Stalling is going to do that. Uh, and it's, it's a little strange because I, I call him Mr. Weaver. That's my pet name. Uh, other people call him Afa, but um, I'm from the South. And we just don't call our elders uh, by their first name without a handle on it. And I've known Mr. Weaver since I was a, a in my salad days when I was green, 1996. 15 years. Right, and his nickname for me is Baby Girl. <laughs> so, um, since before I had crow's feet. So, um, Mr. Weaver, let, let's just talk a bit about your early writing experiences. Um, when did you first start writing? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, I can. Um... It was um, my uh, freshman year at the University of Maryland. I was 16 years old, and um, I had graduated from an engineering high school in Baltimore, Baltimore Polytechnic. And uh, I was taking a composition class, and I just started writing, and I was also falling in love every other week. You know? And so those very first poems, I call my juvenilia, are very awful poems, you know. And some of them are in the archives at Boston University in papers. Um, Your papers are at Boston University? At Boston University okay. in the Gottlieb Archives, okay. that's where they have them. And um, that was the very beginning. Um, in 1970, that spring, um, Nixon ordered the invasion of Cambodia. And um, there were protests all over the country, including the University of Maryland, where I was a sophomore at the time. That's when my students were killed at Kent State and Jackson State. And I dropped out of the. How did you feel about that? Like, what, what, what was going through your mind when that was, when all of that was going? Oh, many things were going through all of our minds. We were adolescents. I was 18 years old by that time. And um, I had been to Washington to uh, the march against Vietnam, the moratorium. Uh -huh. And I had, and that was uh, the fall after Dr. King was killed. Uh -huh. And so I remember going down Pennsylvania Avenue in a crowd of about 200,000 people. Uh -huh. So many people that all oh, I could do, or all any of us could do, was stand on our tiptoes and look around. You had to go with whoever was in front of you. And those experiences and being tear gassed, you know, um, that came while I was there. And of course, growing up in the 1960s, I was uh, one of the children who were placed on buses to go to predominantly white schools. <coughs> and, um, you know, we can argue the, the degree of Baltimore's southernness, but I was raised by families from Virginia and the Carolinas in Baltimore. And uh, Baltimore, uh, the consciousness of Baltimore during the Civil War was predominantly Confederate. Okay. It was forced to stay in the Union by, the, by Washington. Okay. Uh, the government of 
Baltimore was lost. Most of them were placed under arrest and fought again you know, during the war. But uh, uh, so I dropped out and went into um, factory work. And I was working in the steel mill. And um, I was writing at the same time. And um, that's when I, that, at that period, 1970, is when I, uh, I mark as having made a firm commitment to, to being a, a poet and a writer. Uh, again, they were very, you know, juvenile poems. I published my first poem in 1974 in a uh, student publication for the um, the um, Black Student Union at the University of Maryland. Okay, is this College Park or Baltimore? College Park. Okay. College okay. Park. There was a man by the name of Otis Williams who ran the. Uh, he founded the Nuremberg Cultural Center which has a whole new facility there now. Otis passed away. Mm -hmm. Otis was from Mississippi. Okay. But around that time, 1974 and 1975, is when I started, um, is when I met Ethelbert Miller and began to establish. Can you tell people a little bit about who Ethelbert is? Uh, Ethelbert Miller is a poet and an archivist at Howard University. And he's been in that position since the early 70s. And, um, Ethelbert is a social network for American poetry. <laughs> and it's the best way of phrasing A force it. of nature. A force of nature. So I met Ethelbert in 1975. And in 1976, I met uh, Kathy Anderson, Essex Hemphill. Okay. Essex, Essex Hemphill is a, a very well known, he's now passed, but really people credit him with the modern. Uh, black gay male uh, poetry movement. Okay. Essex Essex did uh, Essex opened the door for for um, black gay male writers. Okay. And uh, before Essex did that, it was a very closeted world. It was a very closeted, very closeted world. world. I met Essex in 1976, and he was writing lyric confessional poems okay. that I didn't see anywhere else from any other black. Well, as a black, gay, straight man, how did you respond to, to those poems at the time? Well, is, black, that, is that an okay question? Black, gay, straight man? Yeah, a, a, <laughs> black, oh, a, a black, straight man. <laughs> that no. was a little strange, wasn't it? A no. black, straight man. How did you respond to no. you know, these early kind of poems? I have no problems with that. You know. It's... Um, it's, um, you know, was it a new thing that was happening in black poetry? It was not being done by anybody. Okay. It okay. was not being done by anyone. And um, Essex and Kathy had a journal called Nephula Journal. And uh, I'm smiling because Essex and Kathy, Kathy did all the work and she complained, but Essex was the ideal person. You know. uh -huh. But that journal was fabulous. And so all of this was the late 70s, early 80s. You know? okay. Okay. And um, Essex also did performance art. He uh, did that I didn't know that. Yes, he did. He did. He did. And Essex and, and uh, Gregory Tate was part of that group. Uh -huh. uh, Michelle, um, Michelle, I'm blanking out Michelle's last name. She called me Boo Boo. Michelle Parkinson. Okay. These nicknames, Boo Boo, you know what I'm saying? But Michelle called me Boo Boo. Michelle's a black lesbian feminist filmmaker. Okay. So, so, so what you're saying is it was a very rich intellectual group. In, in Washington. Okay. Tawana okay. Davis was working out uh -huh. of there. She's still very well known. Yeah. yeah, yes, she is. We're Facebook friends. Right? I know. I mean, that's <laughs> <the> friends too. <laughs> Tavani, uh, in those days, Ethelbert started the Ascension Poetry Reading Series, and there was something in Washington called the Washington Project for the Arts. We called it WPA. Okay. And um, I remember one cattle call reading we had went on to 3 o'clock in the morning. There were a couple Oof. hundred of us lined up in the hallways. And Grace Cavalieri started her radio program, The Poet and the Poem, back then. Yeah, in the late 70s, so we could call and read a poem on the air in Washington. And, but it was around 1979 that I started to connect with poets and writers in Baltimore. Okay. First of all, Roger Kamenitz and Andre Kudrescu. Okay. Who's um, down at uh, Louisiana State University now, right? Right. Okay. Right. I met the two of them. 
So I guess that answers your question. I'm sort of went on. <laughs> no, I love that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to back you up a little bit of um, talking about um, the factories. Mm -hmm. How did that working class experience, like now, most of the poets that we know in contemporary American poetry have gone through what a friend of mine calls the cottage industry, the mm. Master of Fine Arts program. But how did that sort of uh, working class experience in the factories mold you as a poet? Well, it, um, it molded me um, in, that, um, in a very practical way. Um, when, in 1975, I spent one semester at Morgan State. And, uh, because after I had gotten into the factory, I realized by uh, a couple of years or so that this was really a very tough place. And well, I had, it was a hard work? It was the monotony. And there were two sections of the plant. This was um, after I left the steel mill. Well, let me get the chronology here. I went into the steel mill in the spring of 1970, and I also joined the military. I joined the uh, Army Reserves, and I joined an intelligence unit that's no longer in existence. They disbanded at the Army Security Agency. I was in the 342nd Army Security Agency as a cook, but that was disbanded and was absorbed into the National Security Agency, but it was Army's intelligence unit. And so I went away from basic training. When I came back in the spring of 1971, I went into Procter & Gamble. There were two departments, packing and manufacturing, and then the warehouse. The packing floors were very difficult. And there was one day I had that reminds me a lot of the Charlie Chaplin film, you know, about mass production. Mm -hmm. But I was on the floor of the liquids department where we made dishwashing liquid and fabric softener. And uh, I, my excuse for getting off the line was to say I wanted to go to the bathroom. But then they said, OK, you've been three times. You can't go anymore. But I was standing there looking at it, and there were four production units. And all of the hundreds of bottles just going around. And I stood there, and I was in shock. You know, um, I was writing at the time, but the difficulty of maintaining your creative energy, your imagination, against that kind of monotony and repetition was my first challenge. But then I got um, a job in the warehouse. I was able to shift there in 1975. Once I got down to the warehouse, I had more mobility, more freedom. And little by little, I was able to read and write more until I got the evening shift and the third shift. The third shift was ideal because um, I was able to read. There were no managers around. Uh, and so so I, you were slacking. We were all slacking. We had a system, and uh, we had a lookout system, but we also had traders in the lookout system, too. So, But um, those guys were supposed to watch the gates in case they came in to try to surprise us. But, so it was in that time that I, for example, um, I gave myself reading projects because Dr. Ruth Sheffley and Dr. Valerie Setnack and Morgan they Morgan was a, a historically black college. This was Zora right? Hurston went. Oh, okay. And where she said she had one dress for the whole time. But um, um, they gave me um, counsel as to how to independently pursue my reading. And so when I was one at the third shift, I gave myself for a few months the, the project of reading um, Anthony Flew's Introduction to Western Philosophy which is based on ideas. The chronology is a chronology of ideas. And so when Andre introduced me to surrealism, I gave myself the project of reading the scholarly work of Anna Balakian, one of the old scholars of surrealism. And so that's what I did. I did, I did that kind of work. And I was writing at the same time. And Hanging Loose Press, mm -hmm. uh, Mark Pollack, Bob Hirshon, Ron Schreiber, those guys uh, were very good to me. They responded to my submissions in long letters and published some of my early poems in the late 70s. So that was my framing. And I was also writing for the Sun Papers. I was a journalist at the time, too. So I developed. While you were still in the factory? Yes, yes, while I was still in the factory. I was writing feature stories and 
my opinion edit, editorial pieces and um, things like that while I was still there in the So now, um, you entered Brown University's creative writing program when? when how, how, how soon after this? It was, it was 1985. Okay. And um, in 1984, I applied for admission to Brown. I, I filled out the application, and I came to the warehouse, and I told the guys I had applied to Brown University. They laughed, and all that they were. And I had also... Uh, why, why did they laugh? It was preposterous. I mean, if, you know, we were in a, a recreation room. And, um, you know, when you're in that kind of work environment, you spend more time with those, your co-workers, and you do your own family sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, over time and so on. But um, these were Vietnam vets, you know. A couple of guys had served time in prison because Proctor Gamma had an ex-offender program. One of my good friends has spent several years in prison in New York. But, and so, the likelihood that they would go to an Ivy League university was just not something that they entertained. Mm -hmm. And especially they didn't think I was going to do it. And so, but at the same time I had applied for an NEA. And as a friend of mine said, it was my day in the barrel, meaning my lucky day. And National just, Endowment for the Arts. Mm -hmm, it was the third application, I believe it was. And uh, so that January, the letter came for the NEA. How much were they giving me? 20000 tax-free, with no taxes on it. I know. Tax-free is lovely, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, President Reagan straightened that out. He taxed it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, when I got it, was tax-free. And then that mm -hmm. April... And they have, like, um, maybe a couple, 3,000 people who apply for those fellowships. At the time that I got it, um, Gwendolyn Brooks and Rita Dove were on the panel. They, were, they didn't know me, but they were. Right, the number one and number two, that uh, Willem Brooks is the first African-American poet to win the Pulitzer, Rita Dove is the second. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I sent them both thank you notes, although they didn't know me. You know? Right. And uh, later in 1985, um, Ms. Brooks had me down at the Library of Congress to read at lunchtime. So. A great lady. She was. She was a great lady. She was funny, too. She was funny. She had a sense of humor. She did. She did. She did. Now, how did you grew up? You like to say that you grew up in the same Baltimore neighborhood that they filmed the HBO series The Wire. And I don't know how many people are familiar, but that's a tough and extremely tough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. How did your Baltimore background both present? a challenge and prepare you for Brown at the same time? Well, <laughs> um, let me preface my answer by saying that I am a survivor. Most of my first cousins that I grew up in Baltimore are gone. Didn't you mean, they're you dead. mean die? They're dead. they're dead. I just buried one this morning. We buried this 45 alcohol. Drugs. But, um, I'm a survivor. It was a small group of us first cousins who were still alive, male, the male. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. how many? So, very. You're saying very many of them make it past their 40s in that neighborhood. The black men get past their 40s. That's that's a try. It's a difficult time, very difficult. Time. And um, quite a few of them. Um, well, when I was a teenager. Three or four of them died of overdose. Um, one of my neighbors was shot to death. And uh, so it goes like that. One of my cousins who was younger than me dropped dead from cocaine use. Um, a friend of the family died from gun after effects of gunshot wounds. Um, just like that. And so um, in my first marriage, um, I have to be tactful about this because these are my, still my family. My mother-in-law still claims me. But um, my, uh, my in-laws uh, were known as the Johnson Boys. And, uh, uh, the Johnson Boys were uh, a force to be reckoned with in Baltimore. And they lived in an outside area. It and was a gang or something? Well, they were perceived that way. Okay. They were all okay. brothers. Okay. They were my wife's uncle. 
very tough game, you know. And so there was that, and you know. Uh, you know. So how was it being this 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 like otherworldly intellectual? I mean, we mentioned all this stuff that. And I know myself, our conversations on the phone, you know, you, I'm always like writing down what you say to read and all of that. How did you reconcile those two worlds? Well, it, it um, you know, I was a smart kid, but, you know, my father's family, you know, they were all, you know, my father, his siblings, 11 of them, <coughs> my grandparents and everybody back, they were all sharecroppers. Um, I did not know a college-educated person in my family until my mother's younger brother married a woman who got a degree in chemistry from a historical black college. So I did not know anyone in my personal life with a college degree. So I had, um, and I was the oldest child, and so I had, um, I had that, but there was no support for that in my immediate circumstance. I mean, I had friends, of course, but not in immediate circumstance. And so um, when I graduated from high school, you know, the people in my neighborhood, my friends, including some of my first cousins, you know, they, you know, we, um, they weren't college bound, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so um, we, were, we would go out for fun and at night in the summertime, I was 16, and, and um, I was in the 2800 block of Federal Street. That was my parents' home and still there. We'd walk up the street to the cut rate, you know, liquor store. And we were too young to buy, but the men would buy for us. Um, yeah, we had Mr. Willie the wine that would do that for us. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so one night. Very we're, illegal. So we, one night we're going out for fun. And in those days, we'd dress up <laughs> because we drank a little bit. And then we'd stand around and sing <coughs> songs, right? And so I. Um, was walking uh, with my friends and there was a guy who was looking for an excuse to be violent and one of us accidentally bumped him and he jumped back and pulled out a gun. And so there we are all of a sudden and I'm the one closest to him. There was nowhere to run. And his name was Shorty. Now, to our, uh, to our luck that night, we had, a, we had a friend whose brother was the kingpin in that part of East Baltimore. And William used to stand on the corner by the cut rate with a top hat and a cane. And he ran, I mean, nobody bothered William. His younger brother was our friend. Nobody bothered his younger brother. So he came by and made the guy put the gun on. Yeah. And so things like that happened. And, uh, and so uh, when I got to the University of Maryland at that time, the University of Maryland was overwhelmingly white. And there were many of them, like me, who had come from an urban environment. And we had, we could get in academically, but we didn't have the social support system. Right, that's always the issue. And a lot of us left, we left. And, uh, or we were in, in embarrassing social situations and where we didn't know how to behave. Mm -hmm. And so we, we came back home, we came home. And uh, so at the same time that this was happening in the late 1960s, there were also the riots. So in the summers in 68 and 69, for example, when this happened, then um, it was also at the time when the, you know, the National Guard was in communities at times. There was a lot of violence in the air. And uh, so that- So when you went to Brown, like, how did you even, if I'm not being interested, how'd you feel walking into, I mean- I felt like- I've been to Brown, you know, it's like the air is different. The year I was born, a movie called, came out called uh, the, the Day the World, The Earth Stopped or something like that. And I felt like that robot, you know, or I was very, I was so other, you know, and. Uh, you just felt really uncomfortable. And I, George Bass took me in. I found familiarity with George Bass. Can you Paul, tell people a little bit about who uh, George Bass? George Bass was Langston Hughes' secretary and uh, the executor of his estate. And with Red Jones, he was co-founder. Red has passed away to a Rice and Reasons Theater at Brown. And so I studied uh, the aesthetics of black theater with, with George Bass. But um, it was really, really very difficult. 
I was 33 or 34 years old, and uh, Sam Gilliam's daughter was in my class. Sam Gilliam was a painter, African-American painter. His daughter was in my class. These undergrads were all privileged, you know, and uh, Senator Kanye's son was there. A lot of money. Uh, Klaus von Bulow's daughter was there. How Prince the Broadway uh, producer, his daughter was there. We call her Daisy Princess, you know. And so there I was in the midst of all of that, and uh, just feeling very awkward, very awkward. Um, but I was there. I was there, and I finished, you know. But um, it was tough. The second year was especially difficult for me, but um, I finished. You know. um, I tell people you can get into Brown, but getting out is another matter. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a couple more questions. Um, one is probably a little involved, but it's one that I've always wanted to ask you. And whenever we have our phone conversations, I'm always on a tangent that, that lasts probably about four to five minutes. And you say, well, I, I got to go. And I never get to ask this question. So because this is your time and I won't do any tangents, I'm going to ask this question. <coughs> now, we've already talked about Gwendolyn Brooks and Rita Dove being number one and number two, the first African-Americans to win the Pulitzer in poetry. And then there's Yusef Komenyaka, who's the third. There's actually only been four. Right. Natasha Trathaway is the fourth. Um, but in particular, that generation, your generation of poets, I think I'm correct in this. The generation of Rita Dove and Yousef, Yousef's older than you, mm -hmm. and Miss Rita is right around, I think, your age. Um, it's the generation that bridged the gap between the poets of the black arts movement and sort of new way of talking about blackness and black poetry. Um, can you talk just a bit for those of us in the audience who are familiar with the Black Arts Movement, like what, how you felt when you started writing, and then how did you feel moving away and, and charting your own destiny from it? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. In, uh, in uh, 1969, 1970, the Johnson Publishing Company had a uh, a small magazine they called the Negro Digest. And they changed the title to Black World. And it was an intellectual forum for black writers. And I subscribed to it. And I grieved the day that Johnson decided to discontinue that little magazine. It's a really great magazine. It was. Do you know you can read them all for free on books.google.com? I will, I will take a look. I, I, I have one or two, but I put them in the archives copies. I have one. Out. Yeah. But um, I looked up to uh, those writers who were 16, 17 years older than I am. Uh, I looked up to them because I, I saw them as being, uh, being the poets. You know? But I also realized as I continued to write when I was in the factory that they weren't writing about the interior lives of black what were they writing about? They were writing about, they were positioning themselves in a discourse with uh, the power, dominant power. And so that uh, the poetry was political in that sense. You know? okay. And it seemed very necessary at the time, but I also knew as someone living in Baltimore as a worker that most people I knew had never heard of them. You know? And so I, I recognized uh, a serious contradiction in the question of audience, who was actually being liberated, who actually knew about them. Okay. Um, so were they talking to the people or were right. they talking to each other? You're right. Okay. In a okay. small literate group. Okay. But then I also realized um, that what I wanted to do was to write about the interior lives of black people, and not knowing that that meant my own at the time. So, um, and then I also, once I came out of the factory and went into the literary world, then I came to understand that it was more about uh, making a career as a poet, which was a harsh realization for me because 
I was in my Trago, Che Guevara frame of mind, you know, like, <laughs> you know, taking my little machete and hacking through the jungle there to liberation, you know. But um, when I came out and realized that people were really more concerned about their, their sustainability as a writer, you know, what that meant, I was in shock in many ways. And then, um, as a good um, working class boy, you know, I would go to my readings and I would dress up the way I'm dressed now so people started to call me bourgeois. So I thought, well, you know, what happened to that? You know, <laughs> and, you know so 15 years or But so. that's the old school way of doing yeah. things in the black community. It's Dressing true. nice and, you know, being a credit to your race, you know? It, it is, it, it is, and, and a good deal of that is, is a certain kind of class statement too. So, but there I was, there I was, you know, and so, um, but the black arts movement, uh, in terms of generations, I was born in 1951. <coughs> I'm sort of the, the last of that generational group. You know, the last. I'm older than Cornelius. Cornelius Eadie. Uh -huh, and younger than Yusuf. You right. Know. Yusuf is 20 years older than I am. Yeah, Yusuf is almost 70 now. Yeah. He was born in 1947. I was born in 1967. Right, he's four years older than I am. Mm -hmm. And so um, um, there was something else I was going to say. It slipped my mind as someone I used to know said it must have been a lie, but um, <laughs> otherwise I'd remember it. But, um, oh, this is what I was going to say. In 1985, when, when Water Song was published, Charles Rao published that book. Um, there were only a handful of us actually working. You know, Black yeah. poets? Yeah. Yeah. Now there's just, I mean, there's I. There's a whole I, nation now. Well, you know, there's a saying some are called, some are sent, and some are sent by their mama. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's a whole bunch of folks out there sent by their mamas. I'm like, everybody can't be touched by the hand of God. Well, it's, a, it's a good thing to have a, a lot of us, but at the same time, well, my, my uh, reference for that is preaching, you know. Preachers were famous for saying, well, you know, I was called to preach, but then the question of the rest of us as well. Some of us were called and some of us heard, heard somebody talking and <laughs> thought we were called. You know. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, my father wanted me to be a minister at, 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 at some Really? Mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah, yeah. My first father-in-law thought I should have been a minister. I guess you never I, have to worry about eating when you're... If, <laughs> if your sermons are good. You know. If your sermons are good. Well, this is the last question, and this is probably a question everyone in the audience wants to hear, but they're too, wants to know, but they're too embarrassed to ask. Mr. Weaver, how on earth did you become a Chinese-speaking black man <laughs> who, who became a scholar of Chinese poetry? I mean, do Dale. How did that happen? So why did you ask me that question? Can you tell me why you asked me that question? <laughs> well, I've always wanted to know. Uh -huh. I've always wanted to know. I know that you told me bits and pieces, uh -huh. but it seems to be a world that you seem completely happy in. Well, you know, I mean, when I when you were the happiest when you were talking about Chinese poetry and um, <laughs> and and you know and it and and you know people have sort of ideas about what black poets should be doing and what they should be writing about and the worlds that they should be entering and you know and this this is an extraordinary thing. I mean, I don't think it's extraordinary for you, but. I think any American who decides to become a scholar of Chinese poetry when they're not a native speaker of Chinese is sort of extraordinary, but a black man from Baltimore, <laughs> I'm well, sorry. I mean, I know there's somebody out here who's like, yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean. Well, I, I, I wouldn't call myself a scholar of uh, Chinese poetry. I would call myself a student of Chinese language Okay. And um, one of the words for a scholar is Shu Shen. Shu is a word for book. Uh, uh, dian, dian, 
Yeah, shoot it around the people who read books, study books. Um, I'm almost tempted to try to answer the question bilingually, but, you know, for example, I could say, Wotai Taiwan, the Eats Arnia. So my first time in Taiwan was in 2002. At that time, I couldn't use Chinese to speak, I couldn't speak Chinese. So when I came back, I realized I should study Chinese. So, so Boston so in 2002, I started to study, study. Now, moving back and forth like that can tell, now, there's some maybe in the audience who can pick out my mistakes perhaps, and it's a little bit, moving back and forth a little bit crude, some of that. But um, that's where I am in the Chinese. And I also read and write, but my writing is, is um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's like a little kid, <laughs> the way it looks. Okay. I don't practice like I should. I should spend an hour a day. The NC, the NC, the NC. Uh, so I don't have time. And so um, it takes, uh, it has taken from 2002 up to now to be able to talk with you bilingually like that. Right. And this is what, and there's a discussion right now about fluency. When you ask someone how fluent they are, fluency involves a lot of things. But um, someone who can do what they do in their first language, for example, um, if you can write, and I can write some of what I said in Chinese and, and simplified characters, some of it in traditional characters, but your ability to write exactly what you say, your ability to read difficult texts, your access to specialized jargon, for example, could I talk to you about pipe fitting in Chinese? Uh, I can't talk to you about that in English, you know, and so, okay. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, or astronomy, you know, right. you know, and so fluency is um, something that people should, when they ask that question, they should consider the levels and so on. But in Taiwan, I tested at the intermediate level of fluency, mm -hmm. and reading, writing, and speaking. So. But um, why did I do it? How did I do it? Well, we probably need a whole other conversation, but I'm a Taoist disciple, which in Chinese means that my Tai Chi teacher pulled me into Taoist instruction. So he teaches me the, uh, the, the inner teachings of, uh, of Taoist sitting meditation, which is the core of Tai Chi. And uh, in, uh, in Chinese, there are two distinctions, nei and wai. Nei is like inside, wai is outside. So an indoor student is someone in the past who would live with the teacher's family. So in today's world, an indoor student is given access. I see. So I'm an indoor student. And <clears throat> last question. Uh -huh. Where do you think your poetry is right now? Uh, and where do you see it going? And it's in a little spaceship headed for Jupiter. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, <coughs> the Plum Flower Dance is the first of a trilogy. The second part will be published by University of Pittsburgh in early 2013. It's such a beautiful press. That's really great press. Yeah, I've been with them for quite a while now. So uh, my soul belongs to the company store. But uh, <laughs> they, uh, the third part I'm working on, it's a trilogy. So I'm working on the third part. Thank you so much, Mr. You're welcome, baby girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all, and...